Well, I don't dare uh, compete with the cuteness level of that. I have a little daughter, well, not little anymore, she's 18, but uh, at one time she was that big and she was she's Chinese, so that brought back lots of memories uh, for me. She never sang as well as that little child, but um, what, a, what a cutie. Well, like I said, we're starting a new sermon series. We're going to call it, it's basically on the, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus' uh, most famous sermon that he gave. If people have heard anything about Jesus and, uh, and you ask him the name of sermon, Sermon on the Mount would, would rise to the top. Um, it's, it's his longest sermon that's recorded in the New Testament. Um, and we're not going to go through it, you know, verse by verse and really uh, cover every aspect of it. I've gone through it. It's in Matthew 5, uh, chapter 5, 6, and 7. So again, it's a long sermon. Uh, I've gone through and kind of picked five or six um, topics that I think would be great for us to address. And we're going to take a look at those. Today, as I mentioned, we're going to look at the Lord's teaching on prayer which if you have a Bible and want to follow along, you can find in Matthew 6, verses 5 through 15. And uh, you may be sort of giving me a little pushback already on this whole idea of prayer. Uh, you might be, you know, some of you might be thinking, hey, you know, I've been a Christian a long time. Come on, Pastor, I know, I know what prayer is, I know how to pray. Uh, you might be thinking, um, uh, come on, let's get to praying. You know, why are we talking about prayer? You know, and some of you might, might even be thinking, oh, well, this is going to be boring. I mean, I thought prayer was boring. Now we're going to talk about praying. You know, that, but wait, I want you to hold on. This, studying this, I got really excited about what Jesus is teaching us in this section today. Uh, he's teaching us some things that, that I, I think we're going to learn some things that we thought were important in prayer, and he's going to point out they're just not. And there are some things that we thought, that's just really not important. That's not an important part of prayer. And he's going to tell us, no, it is. So I think there's, there's going to be some uh, learning going on here, so stick with me. Uh, he's teaching his disciples how to pray and how not to pray. So let's hear what he has to say, uh, starting in verse 5. He starts off by saying, and when you pray. So Jesus assumes that we will be praying, correct? Uh, the following verses, he talks about, and when you fast. So he's also uh, thinking we're going to, to fast as well as pray. It's an assumption that's made. Uh, he goes on and says, don't, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. Uh, the root word for hypocrite here is a word uh, that's also used to form the word actor. Uh, so don't be like those fakers, is kind of what he's saying. Don't be a poser when you're, when you're praying. Uh, and he goes on, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners and be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, he says, they have received their reward in full. Interesting, there's a reward there. Uh, there are some people who, you've probably met them, I, I have met people like this who can, man, they can pray up a storm. Uh, it's this beautiful kind of show that they can put on, and everybody says, wow, what a beautiful prayer that was. Jesus is saying, those kind of people, if they're, if they're not, don't have the right heart behind it, they're faking it, They've got their reward. They got praise from people, and that's all they're going to get. Verse 6, he goes on and says, But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Another comment about a reward. So from there he goes on, and whoa, whoa wait, hold on. Let's back those horses up a little bit here. Don't hurry past that so quickly. We tend to right, fly right by those words, don't we? Let's get to the prayer part. Let's get to the Our Father and learn, you know, how that works. But no, let's pause here for a minute. And notice that he says, go into your room, 
close the door and pray. Now, Jesus is trying to teach us something here. Don't you think that if he had said, now when you pray, raise your hands, that we would all always raise our hands. That would become a part of our regular prayer habit. But he, he doesn't say that. He says, when you pray, go into a room and close the door. How many of us do that? How many of us go into a room uh, and, and close the door to pray? I, I, I see a couple of hands, but by and large, that's it's just not something we do. Now, you might be saying, Pastor, so are you saying that we can't pray unless we go into a room and close the door? No, no I'm not saying that. You know, Let's be clear about that. Prayer is simply talking to God. And so we can do that anywhere, anytime. Uh, but think of it this way. You know, our relationship with God is a lot like a marriage. You know, he even talk, uh, speaks of us, the church, as his bride. So think of it this, this way. Um, if those of you who are married, maybe you can relate, single folks will have to kind of take uh, this by faith. But do you ever find yourself so busy that you say things like, Oh, it just seems like we're two ships that pass in the night. You know, oh, sure, you, you do talk to one another, and, and sometimes you, you say a lot of words, uh, but your conversations sound a lot like some of our prayers, don't they? You know, we'll say things like, hey, I need your help. Can you uh, pick the kids up from school tomorrow? Sure. You know, as we pass in the hall. Uh, thanks for cooking over there at church. You're welcome. You know, that's our whole conversation. What do you want me to do about returning this book to the library? And, and we tend to pray like that as well. God, I, I need some help. Uh, can, can you pr come, up, come, come through for me in this area? Uh, uh, thanks, by the way, for providing last week. And, uh, uh, you know, quick, uh, what do you want me to do about this situation? All fine, legitimate prayers. I'm not saying don't pray like that. But have you ever been in a situation where your spouse says something, especially men, you maybe have heard this, where your wife will say, we don't talk anymore. You know, and as men we say, oh, we're talking right now. <laughs> right? <laughs> but, um, you, you know, maybe your spouse has said to you, we, you talk more to people at work than you talk to me. And you could get all, you know, analytical and say, you know, I've run the numbers and actually I speak 11.12 uh, minutes more to you than I do to the workers. You know, no, that's not what she means. She means she wants to talk with you. She wants to hear and get below the surface and stop these, uh, you know, interactions that are two ships passing in the night uh, kind of thing and get past the surface. Uh, get past the emergency, one sentence kind of stuff. And honestly, this might be a, a secondary um, benefit of this sermon, would be to remind you married folks out there that married people need to spend time together, talking to one another. So couples need to get away and just find time to talk and listen and renew that sense of team and family. Um, imagine a relationship where you only spoke to each other and in short little bursts, and then once a week you went somewhere and sat next to each other and listened to somebody else talk about your relationship. Too often that becomes a parallel to our relationship with God. We offer these quick little shot, shot up in the air or kind of arrow prayers, and, and once a week we come here and, and sit and listen to somebody else talk about our relationship with God. Our relationship should be more than that with God and with each other. Well, as I prepared this sermon, I, I took this seriously, and I, I went into a room, and I closed the door, and I prayed. Not something that I would say was a habit of mine previously, but I did that, and I'm here to tell you, it was amazing what happened. Now, I'll, I'll get to, to that in a little bit here, but Jesus goes on in verse 7 here, and he says, And when you pray, do not keep babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard or another way to uh, interpret that would be to say they'll be taken seriously. They think they'll be taken seriously because of their many words. 
Uh, I heard a story told by a pastor who said that he knew two pastors in his life who were just the most marvelous prayers that he had ever heard. Uh, they could just pray up a storm. I mean, it was the kind of thing where you just knew God paused to listen to these men's prayers. Everybody in their church, when they stood up to pray, you know, kind of elbowed each other like, this is going to be good. Got goose pimples on their, on their neck from waiting to hear what was going to happen. It was like they rattled the gates of heaven with their prayers. But he went on to say that they both ended up failing morally and got out of the ministry. Uh, I love it when people pray something like, God, you know, this is Ralph. You might not remember me. I'm the guy with the red hair. You know, <laughs> they're just being honest. And oftentimes those are new believers who haven't been trained by us old believers how to, how to pray flowery prayers. Jesus is telling us that God values real, honest prayer. Well, in Matthew 6, 8, goes on and he says, Do not be like them, these people who pray for others to hear. For your Father knows what you need before you ask them. So how does that make you feel? The Father knows what you need before you even ask. He already knows. Uh, that makes that other sentence in the verse previous really jump out where it says, you know, don't babble on like these other people using lots of words. He already knows. Why would you, you know, feel the need to keep going over your needs with him when he, he, he knows? You know, I kind of picture him like, <laughs> I knew it before you said it. Now you said it five times to me. I got it. And you might be thinking, well... Then why am I praying at all? If he, if he knows what I'm going to pray before I even pray it. And if you're thinking that, awesome. Because you are so close to a breakthrough on this subject of prayer. You, you might be thinking, well, if he already knows what I need, what am I going to pray about? Again, awesome. You are so close to a major breakthrough in the area of prayer. We know from other places in Scripture that we can tell him anything. But he's saying, let's not make such a, a big deal, a big time commitment out of, in your time of prayer to that part of the conversation. Uh, we'll see when we get into his sample prayer, his, his template that we're supposed to use, that there's relatively few words used to tell God about the things that we need. Because, as he says here, the Lord already knows what you need. I think God would say to us, the right question is, why are you spending so much time when you pray asking me for stuff? I already know what you need. Get on with the other parts of prayer. So again, you might think, well, wait, Pastor, wasn't there something in there about uh, uh, God's going to reward me for part of mine if I pray in a certain way? Uh, the word report, uh, reward means to repay. And uh, we all said, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Let's get some reward going here. Well, the reward for going into your room, closing the door, focusing, and praying, like Jesus is going to teach us to pray, the reward for doing that is a vibrant, real, healthy relationship with the God of the universe. Now, you might hear that and think, oh, that. Or you might think, Oh, really? I, I can't wait to get home and try and, and start using this stuff. I get to have a real, vibrant, living relationship with the God of the universe? I can't wait. That, that should be our, our attitude. So what are the other parts of prayer? How should we be praying? Well, Jesus answers that right here in uh, Matthew 6, verse 9. This, then, is how you should pray. He already just told us, don't pray this way. Don't use lots of words. Don't be a faker like the hypocrites. Here's how you should pray. Our Father, who art in heaven. Start with the Lord. Don't start with yourself. Addressing Him as Father. Now, you may have had a real bad experience with your Father. I don't know everybody's story here. But... Uh, 
even if you did, I would encourage you to still address him as father and to realize, maybe it helps to realize the reason you know your father fell short is because God doesn't. God sets the standard. So the only reason you know this wasn't, this wasn't how it's supposed to be is because there is a model of a perfect father. And that's who you're addressing. So think on that. So our Father in heaven, how would be thy name? How would be your name? Put God in perspective. Your name is to be revered and respected. You are all in all, the Alpha and the Omega, the creator of the universe, the one who made me. You are the judge, the savior, the king, the rock, the door to salvation. You are mighty and powerful. You are God. It puts him in perspective. Jesus is saying, start your prayer by getting your mind refocused and having the right perspective. Realize who you're addressing. Knowing that who it is you're addressing, uh, knowing that will come in handy later in this prayer. Uh, you might have, you know, you might hear that and think, ah, I don't know all the names of God and all that. I would encourage you, if, if you struggle with this area, pray back scripture to him. The Psalms are loaded with um, descriptions and uh, uh, names of God. A little free tip here that I'll offer you. I oftentimes, for my sake, pray out loud, like when I'm in the car. God hears me if I pray silently. It helps me to pray out loud sometimes. Well, Jesus goes on in verse 10. He, he says, okay, so our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. A further shift in perspective. Oh, yeah, you're God. I'm not. I want, I want to be about doing your will. This prayer is not about getting you, God, to do my will, right? This is me, I, that's right, I'm here to do your will, your kingdom come. Another way to think of this is to think of it as, I want the things that are true in your kingdom and in heaven to be true on earth. Uh, I want those kingdom-esque type of things to be true here on earth. Well, what are... What kinds of things are kingdom-esque? Well, people loving one another. That would be a part of this prayer. People caring for the needs of others. Forgiveness. The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Those are the kinds of things. I want your kingdom to come. This, these are the kinds of things I want to see on earth. And because this is a template, he's not saying pray this exact prayer over and over again. These are the kinds of things we should insert at this point. You know, your kingdom come. Well, I, I might not say your kingdom come, but I might say, well, just like in heaven, where people care about one another and have perfect love, Lord, let that be true here. Oh, that's, he's asking us to pray that way. Uh, the Beatitudes are another great example of things that are kingdom-esque. Uh, your will be done. You know, when you're in this place, when you have the, the door closed behind you, uh, and you've honored his name, and you've been reminded of these kingdom, kingdom things, your next move is not, okay, and now here's all the things I want you to do for me. Humility of that moment will drive you to say, God, what do you want me to do? You are this amazing God. You are in control, not me. Your kingdom come. These are the kinds of things I want to have happen on, on earth as they are in heaven. Your will be done. What would you like me to be doing? I heard Andy Stanley of famous pastor humorously say uh, one time, he said, too often our prayer is, my kingdom come, my will be done, on earth, who gives a rip about heaven? Give me this day everything I want, Lord, and everything I can stick in my bank account, and everything I can consume, and everything I can pursue, 
and lead me out of the temptation because I can find that all by myself. <laughs> right? Well, so far you can break this prayer down into three parts. First of all, honor God, uh, your will, not my will, and now we get to talk about us. Okay? We finally get to talk about us. But notice how little time is spent talking about our needs and what we need. Verse 11, give us today our daily bread. That's it. Five words. Six words. That's it. The rest of the prayer is sort of about us, I guess you could say, but it's about our need to forgive others, uh, our need to overcome temptation and the evil one. There's six words there used to say, by the way, Lord, I, I do need things. Give us today our daily bread. That's six words out of 53 words in the entire prayer, which is about 11%. Okay, so that means if you pray for five minutes, 33 seconds of that prayer should be about stuff you need. So, uh, how are we doing? Right? Uh, I don't know about you, but I need to rework my entire prayer life based on just what I just learned, what God just told us about prayer. How much time needs to be spent on me and what I need versus uh, getting my, uh, my perspective where it needs to be and addressing God and praising Him. Well, it goes on, verse... Verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then because we are thick-headed and kind of need this beaten into us a second time, for emphasis, he repeats. Verse 14, for if you forgive others when they have sinned against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others of their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. You know, we hear this theme of we'll be forgiven as in the same manner that we forgive over and over in Scripture. It's what Jesus meant when he said, blessed are the merciful, for they will be given mercy. And when he told the parable of the unmerciful servant, right, you will be forgiven as you or in the same way that you forgive others. This should probably scare us into right living sometimes, right? I mean, I'm not going to experience forgiveness unless I forgive other people. I forgive all of you immediately, right? Now. I don't know if you've ever even done anything to me. You're all forgiven, right? Why would you want that on your conscience? To, you know, I, I, I want God... Certainly, I want God to forgive me, right? I know I've offended Him. Have you ever done it? <laughs> You're forgiven. That should scare us into what it really is. Well, let's wrap up this, uh, this sermon by asking the question, do you pray this way? Like I said at the beginning, you, know, you might be a little bit hesitant here, and you might say, Pastor, do I really have to pray this way? Do I have to go into my room and close the door? No, you don't have to. <clears throat> you, don't, you don't have to experience a breakthrough in your relationship with Christ. You don't, you don't have to be rewarded by God with a vibrant, real faith either. You can go on business as usual, just shoot up those quick, quick prayers that are like arrows in the sky. Uh, crisis after crisis, you could do that. But if you want to take your faith to a new level where you're really experiencing that vibrancy, where your God is rewarding you with that real uh, relationship, try this. Pray. Uh, go into a room. Find a place. Uh, my experience was that it gave me focus. It made it seem like something's going to happen here. This wasn't just I'm driving and, oh, God, you know, help me find a gas station, I'm on AP. This was, Lord, we're, I'm meeting with you. Go into a room and close the door. It adds focus. Uh, don't use too many words. Spend some time listening to what God might be saying as well. Sometimes I picture God being like, oh, but, but I won't shut
shut up, you know? <laughs> and he, he wants to answer my prayer, but I'm, I, I need to stop and listen. Spend a third of your time praising God, honoring his name. Spend a third of your time praying for kingdom-esque kinds of things and getting yourself out of the equation. Spend a tenth of your time asking for the stuff that you need. And then spend time dealing with your need to forgive or to overcome temptation. We all deal with those things. Uh, Matthew 5, 6 reminds us that, uh, that this is a, a command of Jesus. When you pray. Well, this, this painting that's up there, it's kind of skewed. I don't know why it, it's shaped funny. Um, it's not really a square. But what, this is the second time I've given this sermon to a church. And the first time I did this series, I um, said very foolishly at the very beginning, I'm going to create a painting to go with each of these sermons. And, and when I was done, I said, <laughs> I'm never doing that again. It was so much work to try and come up with a painting and create a painting and, you know, work on a sermon. But this is the painting I came up with that, as I studied this, was this door. Maybe you can see the cross on the door. And the clouds that are behind it, uh, each cloud has a phrase from the, from the Lord's Prayer written on it. And it was just kind of my uh, way of finding another way to have God's Word processed through me. Uh, to physically create something that went with it. And so I'll show you the, the sermon or the, the paintings that I made with this with these sermons as we go through it here. But um, this was the one that I did for the uh, Lord's Prayer. Well, let's uh, wrap up by praying to God, as we always do. But let's pray to Him in, a, in the manner that we've just learned, in the style of yeah, using the Lord's Prayer as a template. So pray with me. I, I spent some time and created something here. Father, you are God, and we are humbled and blessed to be able to pray to you. You are the king of everything, God. The power to be able to speak, the, you have the power to speak the universe into existence. You hold us in existence. You are alive before anything we know about, and you will be alive forever. You planned how the stars would line up, and you made us to be just so. Psalm 104 tells us that you are very great, and you are clothed in light, and you search out the heavens like a tent. You stretch out the heavens like a tent. You make the clouds your chariot, and the wind your messengers. You are Lord the one we bend our wills to. Keep our, our hearts humble, knowing that you alone are the king. We want only what you want, your wishes alone. <coughs> May your kingdom advance as we pour out love to our community, to the people we know and interact with. Uh, May your kingdom advance and, and bring peace to our world, patience with our brothers and sisters. May our joy overflow as we see kindness and gentleness rule the day. Work through us to make our world more like your world. Lord, provide what we need. The money to fund projects, the, the clear direction to be able to move out in confidence and generous hearts to see where we can, are keeping too much for ourselves. Allow your Holy Spirit to move in us and to convict us of unforgiveness. Give us the wisdom and knowledge when we are holding a grudge and the moxie to go and make things right. Shield us and our children from the amazing amount of temptation that comes our way. We're tempted at every turn to trust in something other than you. And that's idolatry. Give us the strength to fight the evil that's in this world and to overcome so that one day we can walk with you down the streets of heaven and knowingly look into each other's eyes and see the comradeship that is reserved for two friends who have gone through a difficult time together. Lord, we ask this all in your name. Amen. Amen.